Okay, so we're back with part two of our map elements lecture. And in this part, we're going to move on to the next element. So we've already covered the main element, which is the core data, the orientation, in this case represented by a north arrow that tells the user what direction to orient the map so that it faces north. We've covered scale, in this case with a scale bar and a representative fraction. And we've talked about the pros and cons of both of those. The next big piece that I want to talk about is actually going to be this piece right here. Um, so this is going to be the legend, or sometimes called the key. Now, what the legend or the key does is it provides a critical connection between the symbology of the main element and what they represent in the real world. Right, so this links the symbology of the main element with the information necessary to interpret it. Right. So for example, in our example here, right, our key features or our legend or our key, right, is telling us that any of these sort of pale red lines here, these are representing highways. The thinner sort of orangish lines are representing local roads. Lines that have the hash marks are representing railroads, right? And now, so you might on the one hand be saying, hey, in this case, most of the stuff in the legend is, is mildly obvious, but it's still important to have. And I want to show you another example. We're going to go back to the, the demographics example that we looked at for thematic maps. Just give me one second here. Oop, that's the topo. Here we go. Um, right, that you can see in this case, right, where we have a choropleth map, which is a type of thematic map, right? If I did not give you this legend right here, you would have no idea what the different colors meant. Right now, you do. You know that this sort of beige's color means that the population of that area has less than 20% Hispanic. And the dark blue areas down in here have populations that are nearly 100, greater between 80% and 100% Hispanic. Right, so legends provide very important context for the user to be able to interpret whatever the main element is trying to show. And it's very important when you make the legend to think about what types of symbology you're using and how to best represent them in the legend. So when it comes to constructing the legend, and we'll talk more about this in later videos, but right now, what I want to do is I want to highlight when you're constructing the legend, right, the question is what features to include. Right, as the geospatial scientist or the GIS analyst, right, you know all the different layers that went into making this map, right? And if you look at here specifically, right, you'll see that I have a boundary profile for Mount Pleasant, Michigan, right? This sort of light, pale, yellow, tan, whatever color you want to call it, right? This is a layer in the GIS, right? This is a layer, two layers in the GIS, right? This county's layer down here. But yet none of those showed up in the layer in the, in the legend because they aren't important enough, right? So what features to include? I think it's best to actually flip this and what features to not include is probably a better way to phrase this list. 
right? When do you not need to put something in the legend? One, if it is background only, Right, so for example, the outline of Mount Pleasant, right, that's only background. I don't, the user doesn't need to know what that is because they're never going to be interacting with that part. At least they shouldn't really be interacting with that part. So it serves no purpose for the user to know about it. So if it's background only, right, if it is, and I'm going to put this in all caps, the I-O-U-S, or if it is obvious what it is, Um, and I'm going to underline obvious. You have to be very careful here because obvious to you is not necessarily obvious to everybody, but you will see from time to time things being omitted from a legend because it is obvious what they are. You can get away with that from time to time. So those are really the only two reasons not to put something in a legend. If it's a background thing, so you know it's not, it's not critical that the user knows what it is, so for example, if we were to have a thematic map showing population density and we threw rivers on there as a visual aesthetic, right? those might not end up in the legend. Um, if it's obvious what it is, so if we have lakes, right? lakes are pretty obviously blue splotches. right? As long as, as long as you're confident that everybody's going to know what it is, you don't have to include it. So just to recap, the core point of the legend is to connect the symbology of the main element with the information that the user is going to need to be able to interpret it. All right, number five, let's talk about this boy down here. Number five. So this is what's called an inset map. So what an inset map does is it serves one of two things. Usually it will give a geographic context. Right, so for example, in this case, right, people may not be familiar with Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and where that is. Right, this inset map here gives a geographic context by connecting. This map would normally be much larger, but I've scaled it down for the sake of being able to look at all the map elements. Um, right, this red dot here represents this layout here. So we now know, okay, Mount Pleasant is basically in the exact center of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Right, so inset maps can give a geographic context by saying, where is this, right? Inset maps can also be used to zoom in on an area to provide greater detail. Right. You'll see this oftentimes when you're dealing with choropleth maps that include major cities as well as rural areas, because things in major cities tend to happen on a much smaller scale. Right? Zip codes, census tracts, all of that tend to be much smaller, so things get much more, much more cramped. So what you'll often see people do is they'll show the entire distribution, like we have here, and then they'll zoom in on individual pockets to look at each individual pocket in detail. So again, a good example of this would be census data comparing rural areas to cities, right? Cities have a lot more going on, so normally zoom out a city and look at that at a higher, res at a higher uh, scale. So that's inset maps, right? They're, they're a sub map, a smaller map that tends to either give a geographic context to the main element or they zoom in to give more detail on a smaller area from the main element. Okay. 
So what else have we got? We've got this piece here. Um, can I squeeze it in here? I think I can. All right, we have seven, which is the title. So here's the thing about titles. Titles are supposed to be a standalone description of the purpose of the map, right? One way that I've always thought of titles and other people have told me is that if you think about, think about the title as if you were blindfolded and somebody only read you the title, you should be able to tell them what's going to be on the map. Not necessarily the spatial pattern because you can't see it, but you should know what, what to expect to find when they take the blindfold off, right? So a title is going to be a short, and I'm putting short in all caps, and I'm underlining it, description of what the purpose of the map is. Right. If you have a really bad title or a misleading title, that is going to negatively impact how your map is received by the user. Right. If your map title says something like, oh, population of or GDP by census track for the United States, and you really are showing, you know, the demographics of population density for Florida, that's a very misleading title. Right, and that's that's a that's a hyperbolic example. Hopefully, you would never do something quite that bad. But you definitely come across from time to time maps where people haven't given the title enough consideration, and so it doesn't really accurately reflect the purpose. So always make sure that your title is number one short, as short as it can be, while still conveying the purpose of the map, so that the user doesn't have to look at the map to know what they're trying to look at. They can read the title and know whether or not they want to continue. Okay, so scroll. We've got one last piece down here at the bottom that I want to cover. It's tucked in right down here. Okay. All right, so that piece right there, I'm going to try and tuck it in here. Right, this is what's called reference text. Sometimes you'll see it called attribution text. Sometimes you'll see it called other text. Right, regardless of the title, the purpose of this is this is the text that tells the user the thing this is going to be the reference text that tells the user things that they might want to know if they really are interested in the map um, so this is the stuff that the average user is not going to care about but somebody who is truly trying to critique your map or cares a lot about cartography is going to want to know that you crossed your i's and dotted your t's so things that are going to go into this reference text right this is going to be things like your data source right where did you get your data Right? Did you make it yourself? Did you use a standard data library like the US Census? Did you find something from Joe's Crab Shack? Right? Like, where did you find your data? Because that's important. Two is going to be the projection. And we're going to spend a lot of time in a couple of lectures here, in a couple of lecture videos, um, really talking about projection and why it's important and what can go wrong when you don't use the right projection. So projection is just one of those things that if you care about maps and map quality and you see a map, you should always look to see what did they use as their projection? And is that projection appropriate for what they're trying to demonstrate? Because if it's not, that can cause um, 
issues with interpretation. And then finally, write author. Hopefully that's you. It should be an H in that. A author, right? That should be you, but maybe it's not, right? You should always, just like where did you get your data, right? Who made the map? Was it you, right? You should always make sure that you're either give credit or take credit for whatever it is that you've done here, okay? So with that, those eight elements are the ones that appear most often on most maps. So to recap, we have the main element being the core data and the focus of the map. We have the north arrow or graticule showing orientation. So which direction do we orient the map so that it faces north? We have the scale, which is in this case represented by a scale bar, but could also be represented by a representative fraction or a verbal scale. Just keep in mind that if you change the size of the map, you break representative fractions and verbal scales. We have the legend or the key which connects the symbology in the main element with the information necessary for the user to be able to interpret it. We have oftentimes some form of inset map, whether it is like in this case, giving a geographic context to an area, or maybe it is a zoom in to provide detail on a particularly cluttered part of the main element. Either one of those is, rel is useful. We also have, oh, we skipped six. <laughs> we went to seven. Um, we also have the title, which is a short description. The idea being that if a, if a user reads the title, they should know what they're going to find on the map. And then finally, we have the reference text or attribution text or other text, which is generally just things that somebody might want to know if they want to dig a little bit deeper into the map. So hopefully that made sense. Hopefully all these elements make sense. In the next episode or the next video, we'll talk about how we actually lay these things out in what's called a layout and what kind of things we need to consider to make sure that the map looks as good as it possibly can. So as always, if you have any questions, please reach out. Thank you.